Uh, I'm up next, and I'm going to talk about interventions for primarily chronic pain, procedural interventions for chronic pain and their value. I think this is uh, an important topic, maybe becoming more and more important uh, with the advancement of the CDC guideline, putting a damper on opioid use and encouraging non-pharmacological therapies. So uh, I'd like uh, primary care physicians and practitioners like yourselves to understand what is possible in terms of the interventional procedures for chronic pain so that you, when you identify patients who may be candidates, you can refer them to pain specialists. I have my disclosures listed on the slide. I'd like you to be able to identify patients who can benefit from certain interventional procedures, recognize certain procedures for spinal and non-spinal pain, and then finally describe patients who can benefit from some of the neuromodulation therapies. I'll talk about spinal cord stimulation, a little bit about peripheral nerve stimulation, but I think you know, the market for these devices is huge, and uh, the application of neuromodulation techniques, neurostimulation, is ever increasing, so I'd like you to have an understanding of what's available now for patients who have chronic pain. Well, certainly we, we know that there is a dual public health problem in this country. We have 116 million Americans who suffer from chronic pain. And on the other hand, now we've been bombarded in the media by the problem associated with opioid overdose and death. I think that the CDC guideline is putting a damper on opioid supply. And I think that's gonna have, and it seems like it's having a significant impact on the numbers of us, primary care physicians and pain specialists who are prescribing opioids. Prescription monitoring programs, I think, also have a role in terms of reducing risk associated with opioid prescriptions, multi-sourcing of opioids by pain patients. REMS programs can also benefit, and uh, some of the new drug formulations, the, the abuse deterrent formulations, may also have an impact mainly on, I think, you know, the abuse of opioids, inhalational abuse, intravenous abuse of opioids, not necessarily the abuse of opioids orally at all. Well, the CDC guideline indicates non-pharmacological therapies, non-opioid therapies are the thing to do. That's what they're focusing on and emphasizing. What are those? Well, they list several. Exercise, they feel like exercise, and there's evidence based that exercise is useful for reducing hip osteoarthritic pain or knee osteoarthritic pain. Weight loss, useful for knee osteoarthritis. CBT, CBT useful for many different types of chronic pain, fibromyalgia, tension type headaches, migraine headaches, low back pain. But they also talk about some procedures, and this is why I think this is important because I think we're gonna see a rise in the number of perhaps procedures that are offered to patients because, well, you heard in the last talk, gosh, many of us may be reluctant to use NSAIDs. More of us are gonna be reluctant to use opioids. Well, I mean, we have tricyclic antidepressants, we have anti-epileptics, we have integrative therapies. I think we're going to see more of those used as well. But I want to talk about procedures. They do talk about, the CDC guideline does talk about procedural interventions. For example, intraarticular injections for osteoarthritic pain and rheumatoid arthritis pain. Subacromial bursa injections for patients who have rotator cuff tears or injury. And epidural steroid injections for patients who have you know, lumbosacral radicular pain. Well, historically, a lot of the analgesics that we use today were developed in the 20th century, things like acetaminophen, NSAIDs, and opioids. Uh, the expansion of spinal and epidural anesthesia existed in the 20th century as well, to the point where more and more of those techniques were used for acute pain settings, the perioperative setting, for example, regional anesthetic techniques to block parts of the arm or the leg for surgery, and then the application of those techniques for chronic pain. The intrathecal use of medications like intrathecal morphine, for example, um, bupivacaine, Dilaudid, began in the 1980s. And spinal cord stimulation actually was first applied in 1967 by a neurosurgeon named Dr. Sheely, who placed it in the thoracic spine for a patient who had intractable pain from bronchogenic carcinoma. And it was reported that that patient um, benefited tremendously from the use of the stimulator device, even though I think he might have lived just for two weeks or so. The expansion of spinal cord stimulation, though, really began in the 1990s to the point today where we have six different, six different manufacturers of spinal cord stimulator devices. Why do we do injections? Well, we do them for multiple reasons. 
they do have therapeutic value. They have diagnostic value too. I mean, often it's not that easy to figure out, for example, why a patient has low back pain. Is it the facet joint? Is it the disc? Is it a disc herniation? Is it the muscles? Anesthetic blocks, therefore, can help sometimes establish the basis for the etiology of pain when several possible sources exist. And that's not infrequent either, even with headaches, for example. I mean, sometimes it's difficult to determine whether there's a, the, the occipital neuralgia may be a component of migraine headaches. And I'm getting more and more referrals from some neurologists who, who want me to perform occipital nerve blocks in patients who have migraine headaches because they feel like that might be the etiology. They have prognostic value too. Local anesthetic injections can help predict whether patients should move on to, for example, a radiofrequency procedure in the lumbar spine that can provide more sustained relief. And certainly there are expectations on the part of other doctors, referring doctors, patients, and colleagues. This is a picture that I thought was funny. It was a cartoon that was brought to me by a patient uh, who had seen multiple other specialists and had 10, I don't know how many injections, multiple injections, spinal surgery, and so on, integrative therapies. And this says Johnstown Acupuncture Associates. And you can see that the, the two other providers are there are saying, you've got to be kidding, your back still hurts? I mean, this is what I sometimes hear from patients who've had multiple procedures and they feel like, gosh, can't, doesn't anything, isn't anything gonna help me? Well, sometimes actually the wrong procedure has been performed or maybe they're not candidates for procedures anymore, frankly. I wanna talk about low back pain because low back pain is one of the top three chronic pain conditions. You can see here the cause of low back pain is multifactorial, can range from facet joint disease, the sacroiliac joint, from herniated discs, stenotic areas of the spinal cord, or stenosis around the spinal nerves. Discogenic pain, meaning degenerative disc disease, can lead to low back pain, and certainly there can be a muscle component to low back pain too. Let's talk about epidural steroid injections because these are performed frequently. What are the indications? Typically, remember this, it's the neuropathic pain, the shooting radicular component of pain that the data tell us uh, are the most beneficial or will most benefit from epidural steroid injections. And that can be, you know, they may have neck shooting arm pain, back shooting leg pain. And the source can be several, but typically stenosis or disc herniation. And the approaches I'll just go over with you so you can understand what we do, can be uh, epidural steroid injections in the neck, thoracic spine, lumbar spine, or even near the tailbone. There can be a transforaminal specific nerve root approach as well. A lot of these, most of these are all performed under fluoroscopy, some under ultrasound now, and preceded by radiographic contrast. I just wanted to show you here a picture of the lumbar spine. I think this is helpful. I use this for the residents and the fellows too. Uh, this is the ligamentum flavum. This is the structure that we penetrate when we do intralaminar epidural steroid injections to access the epidural space. You can see here's the spinal cord. The spinal nerves are here. Here is the vertebral body and the discs here. Spinous process, lamina there. This is, you know, I've had some patients not really fully understand what it means to have a disc herniation. And it can mean two things generally. One is that you have a disc that actually compresses the spinal nerve, leading to back pain and radicular pain. But you can also have a disc that becomes degenerated and releases inflammatory mediators like cytokines, TNF-alpha, for example. And there's no compression at all of the nerve root, but that um, inflammatory mediator irritates, if you will, sensitizes the nerve root and can lead to back pain and shooting leg pain. And this can occur in the neck as well. This is a woman who presented with low back pain and left lower extremity radicular pain that extended laterally. And this is what the MRI looked like. This is a transverse view of the MRI. We're at L5S1 here. Here's the disc. Sorry, yep, here's the disc. And here is the spinal cord. You can see here a disc herniation off laterally to the left, right there, impinging on the nerve root leading to the symptoms. By the way, these are the facet joints here and here. And you can see synovial fluid inside the facet joints. Well, when we perform interlaminar between the lamina injections in the lumbar spine, we do this, as I mentioned before, with the needle penetrating the flavum and accessing the epidural space. You can see that there is venous plexus there, so sometimes you can get into uh, heme or you know, heme can develop and therefore we might move the needle in, uh, laterally or move to a different level. This can be performed in patients who've had spine surgery, and sometimes you know, they've had two or three spine surgeries. You can't access the lumbar spine using the interlaminar approach, but you can access it using the caudal epidural space. And this is a really useful technique because it bypasses the problems 
in the lumbar spine uh, from surgery, meaning the lack of access in the lumbar spine. So this is a small needle that's inserted along the tailbone under x-ray guidance, and the injectate, steroid, local anesthetic, saline, is injected superiorly. It bays the sacrum, the sacral nerve roots, and moves superiorly. If the volume's high enough, it can move up to, you know, L5 or so, and can be very helpful in patients who otherwise would not have access to this procedure because of, if you will, fail back surgery syndrome. Interlaminar neck injections. This is a little bit more delicate, as you might imagine, but this is performed too. Uh, usually at C7T1, the flavum is the most consistent there and the thickest there. We can perform it at higher levels, five, six, six, seven, and so on, uh, as well if the pathology is a lot higher and you can't, you know, if the injectate will not move superiorly enough, then you can inject uh, at higher levels in the cervical spine. Again, useful for patients who have not really just neck pain, not axial neck pain, but radicular pain down the arm. This is an interesting approach that's been used more and more often. It's the transforaminal, across the foramen approach. This targets the nerve root. Here's a transverse view. Here's the disc. The annulus is here, nucleus fibrosis there, that gelatinous material. Here's the spinal cord here, and this is the epidural space. I think a lot of us forget that the epidural space is not only posterior, but there's an anterior epidural space, right? It exists throughout around the spinal cord. So when we target the needle here along the nerve root, the injectate often moves this way into the ventral epidural space. And some of the studies have suggested this is a more effective approach than the interlaminar because you're closer to the area of pathology. If the disc is herniating this way, that is posteriorly, you're closer to the pathology. Also, you're closer to the dorsal reganglion, which exists right here. Interlaminarly, you would approach it here. Here's the flavum. Here's the spinous process. Paraspinal muscles are here. Well, who are the ideal candidates for ESIs in the lumbar spine? Radiculopathy caused by herniated discs, shorter duration of pain, meaning less than six months, Leg pain, more than back pain. I mean, some, you know, often when, when patients develop disc herniations, they're going to have back pain. It's not, I mean, I see some patients who just say, I have, back, I have shooting leg pain, but often it's back pain and leg pain. But the back pain component should be greater. No psychological overlay, overlay self-employed, uh, younger age, and the, that the pain is intermittent, meaning it's not there constantly during the day. It's there off and on. Less favorable prognosis if the disc is degenerative, if the pain has lasted more than six months. If they just have back pain, they're not really good candidates for this procedure, frankly, based on the evidence. And if they've had failed interventions, you know, multiple spine surgeries, they've had previous injections, or they're on opioids, probably not good candidates here. This is what it looks like under fluoroscopy. Here's the needle in being inserted into the epidural space. You can see contrast here outlining the epidural space. This would be an example of that transforaminal approach. The needle is along the nerve root, and you can see the, uh, the outline of the nerve root at this level. We have about 60% of more than 40 at this point controlled studies that show short-term benefit from these injections. Less evidence for long-term benefit. It usually provides relief for about six weeks or more. But we have, now if you compare tra this transforaminal approach to the interlaminar approach, we have some studies that suggest that that transforaminal approach is better because of what I mentioned before, maybe closer to the area of pathology and also maybe because it targets closer to the dorsal root ganglion. But if you look at other outcome measures, you can see that there's moderate evidence, well actually, that if you look at both the interlaminar and transforaminal approach, more recent evidence suggests that they're equal in pain relief and functional improvement for lumbosacral radicular pain. Some of the evidence suggests that steroids can speed the rate of recovery and return to function. In fact, there was a recent study, 2016, I think it was a retrospective or it might have been an observational study, that showed that epidural steroid injections in the lumbar spine may prevent the need for surgery in up to 80% of patients. It's pretty good. There's strong evidence for short-term efficacy, that is less than six months, moderate evidence for long-term efficacy, at least six months or more in managing pain and disability from lumbosacral disc herniation. Keep that in mind. Let's move on to the facet joints. The facet joints are actual synovial joints. They are, they're innervated by two medial branch nerves that are derived from the posterior primary ramus. They, the facet joints protect our spine from axial loading from the shearing forces of the spine and help support the spine along with the disc in terms of those forces that are placed downward on it. 
this is an example of the facet joint. I'll show you another one. But essentially, it's showing this primary dorsal ramus. And there are branches of that. There's an intermediate branch, a medial branch. And the medial branch is what supplies the facet joints. And that's what we're targeting here. Here's a closer view of that. Here's the facet joint here, here. And you can see the nerve. One of the branches of that ramus is innervating the facet joint. This is a sort of an oblique view. Spinous process here. Here's the lamina. The disc is here. This is the, um, these are the sympathetic nerves. Here's an axial view of the MRI of what the facet joint looks like. Here's the disc. Spinal cord is in here. It looks like there's central canal stenosis there. But here's the, here are the facet joints. You can see this little tiny area here that's light colored. Well, that's the synovial fluid inside the facet joint. And these joints look hypertrophic or arthritic. What do patients present with? Well, you know, they often will say they have deep pain, it's achy, it can be more diffuse, but usually axial in the neck and the low back. It can extend to the base of the skull or down to the scapula. Whiplash injury can cause it. Certainly arthritis of the joints, joint enlargement like joint hypertrophy can cause it, or spine surgery as well. Uh, the approach to this is usually fluoroscopy, patients are on their belly, and those little nerves are targeted with a small, you know, say 25 or 22 gauge needle. Local anesthetic, maybe a half, a half a cc or less is injected along the length of the nerve. This is a depiction of what the referred pain can look like in patients who have neck pain specifically from the facet joints. So this is saying C2, 3, let's see, C2, 3 facet joint refers pain in this area, 3, 4 in this area. You can see, you know, 5, 6 can refer pain in the lower neck down to the upper scapula. So uh, also there are referral patterns in the lumbar spine. It can be, you know, patients who have just, I have patients who will say, I have pain exactly in the center of my spine, you know, on top of the spinous processes. That really is not facet joint mediated. Uh, I'm not sure what that is, to be honest, but it's not facet joint. Usually facet joints are paraspinal. And here are the referral zones for lumbar facet syndrome. You can see it can be focal paraspinally, but it can also refer down to the buttock posterior thigh. Not usually in the legs. I, I don't really see that, but I usually see lumbar spine, maybe the buttock area. Radiographic evidence of facet arthropathy is not always present. True, true, true. Often it, it's not. Uh, and that's why the diagnostic injections can be helpful. When patients respond to these diagnostic blocks, 50% relief is what we're looking for over the course of the length of the local anesthetic. Example, if we're injecting, you know, um, dupivacaine, well, the length, the duration of action should be at least six hours, eight hours or so. So patients should report that much relief after we do the diagnostic block. If they run out of the clinic and, you know, they say, oh my God, you know, 10 minutes later, my pain returned. Well, you know, that's not really, either we didn't do the block correctly or the facets are not involved. But the denervation procedure is what's next. And that's what provides more sustained relief. The procedure is performed along the length of those small little nerves that I showed you before. Along the length of these nerves is where the denervation procedure is performed at various different levels. And in the neck, the nerves are extremely small. Uh, and they exist along the articular pillars right here, here. These are the small little medial branch nerves that supply the facet joints in the neck. Similarly, block with local anesthetic and then can be denervated. Well, is denervation effective, right? That's the key question here. It is, if you look at the data. Well-controlled studies have now established that these, the radiofrequency denervation in the neck and the low back is quite effective in the short term and long term. What are the predictors of success, though? Well, paraspinal tenderness. You know, for a long time, we felt like, gosh, you've got to do this facet loading, extend, twist, rotate laterally. It's, if you look at more recent data on this, that the facet loading exam is not particularly indicative of facet joint pain, whereas paraspinal tenderness is. Less psychopathology and fewer levels affected are good or better predictors of success of radiofrequency denervation here. The other question is, well, patients will say, well, okay, let's do it. I got, I had great relief for three or four months. And it's true, the nerves regenerate. Can the repeat denervation be helpful? The answer is yes. The repeat radiofrequency denervations can be quite successful in both the neck and the low back with the similar duration of action. Complications from this are minimal, less than 1%. Now, neuritis can develop. But if we inject a little local, a little steroid after we perform the denervation, that reduces the risk. 
Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't you know, list some other therapies for low back pain, for chronic low back pain, and they can be, others can be beneficial, so non-intervention certainly can help. Exercise, we've heard about. NSAIDs, we recently heard about. Uh, you know, I use the antidepressants, tricyclics, perhaps SNRI like Cymbalta at times for, for low back pain as well. Certainly acupuncture for neck and low back pain, there's an evidence base for. Massage therapy and CBT. Let's now talk about the sacroiliac joint. This joint exists between the sacrum and the ilium. It exists right here, and here you can see it a little bit better. It's a very, very tight joint between the sacrum and the ilium. And it's sort of an underestimated, I think, source of pain on the part of surgeons and primary care physicians and even pain specialists. It's heterogeneous. Think of this, if patients report low, quite low, low back pain, around L5 or around the sacrum, think of the SI joint as a possible etiology. It, you, we usually see it in those that are younger or older. There can be intra-articular pathologies for this inside the joint or extra-articular along the ligament can lead to pain in this area. Trauma is a major factor up to 50% of the time. Leg length discrepancy, even like a four millimeter difference or less, can lead to sacroiliac joint pain. Patients who have scoliosis are more predisposed to this pain as well. Certainly if they've had spine surgery, they are. And uh, if they have trans transitional anatomies, they can be more predisposed to sacroiliac joint pain. Here are some referral zones, similar to the facet joints. The referral zones for the SI really are gonna be, think of the low back around L5 or the buttock. Those are the prime areas. This is a retrospective study that was done several years ago. Um, you know, 50 patients or so, not a tremendous number. Nevertheless, it gave us some indication of where the referral zones are for sacroiliac joint pain. The injection is, uh, so the indications are, as I mentioned, low, quite low back pain, buttock pain. It's rare that it's in the groin, frankly, but can be sometimes. Patients will say they've fallen or they've lifted something heavy. They're moving. They're moving boxes, for example, from one house to another. And boy, they've quickly lifted the box and they've developed low back pain, maybe sometimes buttock pain. Prolonged lifting and bending can be another source of pain for, sacral, for the sacroiliac joint. The injection is uh, performed intraarticularly, typically under x-ray guidance, maybe under CT as well. And this is what it looks like. This is an x-ray view fluoroscopic view of the joint injected with contrast. You can see that this outlines the anterior and posterior element of the joint. Control studies have reported short-term relief with sacroiliac joint injections. Limited, though, evidence for long-term relief. However, similar to the facet joints, you can denervate these. There's a, an attendee yesterday who asked about the uh, genicular blocks, you know, for knee pain, knee osteoarthritic pain. Well, there's been an ad, I think, on TV that I haven't seen about the cool leaf procedure. And what they're talking about is cooled radiofrequency ablation for the knee. This procedure, cooled RF, can be performed in other parts of the body. The sacroiliac joint is one of them. Uh, if you look at the data on denervating this particular joint, the nerves to the joint, it can provide long-term relief for those that obtain relief from the temporary blocks. Uh, if the idea here, though, in terms of the cooled RF versus the conventional is that the cooled RF produces a larger lesion, so you're more likely to target the nerves of interest and provide significant relief. That's what it comes down to, cooled radiofrequency versus conventional radiofrequency. The lesion size is different too. It's bigger in the cooled radiofrequency. The cooled element means there's a, you actually run water, cool water through it, to the device, and it removes heat from surrounding tissue to prevent charring there and allows the lesion uh, to expand. What's the evidence? Well, fair for cooled RF in terms of relief, three to 12 months of relief. Patients have asked me, well, God, I'm gonna get a year's worth of relief from this, aren't I? I mean, especially the knee. And I haven't seen a year's worth of relief, to be honest with you, not seen a year's worth, but I have seen six months or more, which is pretty good. This is what it looks like. Here's the uh, let's see, here is the cooled radiofrequency lesion. And you can see here's the tip, and the lesion size is quite a bit bigger and more expansive than it is with conventional radiofrequency. This is an elliptical shape versus spherical. You can see there isn't much of a lesion extension beyond the tip of the needle here, whereas there is in the cooled procedure. The lesion size for the cooled can be twice that of the conventional radiofrequency procedure. I wanted to talk, too, now about visceral pain. This is a huge subject. Uh, I think it was mentioned maybe yesterday 
um, you know, in terms of the central sensitivity syndromes, irritable bowel syndrome, for example, chronic abdominal pain, chronic pelvic pain. I'm sure you see these patients. I mean, I do too. And, you know, it's not that easy to treat pain in these areas. And we don't have a good evidence base for medication therapies, for integrative therapies, or the procedural therapies for visceral pain. And yet, you know, it, it's a not an uncommon problem. You know, patients report achy, um, diffuse pain, it's often difficult to localize. Autonomic reflexes are triggered too. They'll f they feel like they sweat at times, certainly when they have you know, visceral pain or pelvic pain. And they can have hyperalgesia in cutaneous areas. The stimuli are often ischemia, inflammation, traction, and hollow organ distension. There can be blocks that can be performed for this along the sympathetic nervous system. I just wanted to mention three, stellate ganglion blocks, can be performed for, and I mentioned this yesterday, complex regional pain syndrome. So patients who have CRPS, previously known as RSD, still known as RSD, frankly, uh, of the arm, uh, because the stellate uh, is, provides efference to the ipsilateral face, the arm, for example, part of the upper chest. So for patients who have, for example, CRPS of the arm, can't tolerate physical therapy, the stellate ganglion block can be quite helpful. It's performed in the neck. Uh, celiac plexus can be helpful for visceral abdominal pain, and the hypogastric plexus block can be useful for pain in the pelvic region. This is the stellate ganglion. This is what the stellate ganglion looks like. It's right here along C7, T1. It's a neck, sort of a deeper neck structure, and a needle is placed around C7, uh, actually about C6 or so, um, or seven, and local anesthetic is injected to block that particular ganglion, usually under x-ray guidance. I think when I did my fellowship, I remember doing these without any, without any guidance at all. It was just, the thought was, okay, we're just gonna you know, palpate the area, and I, I was scared to death because I couldn't palpate, you know, I couldn't palpate anything other than the muscles. Um, but today, these are done, you can be done under ultrasound or fluoroscopy. Uh, this is an example of the hypogastric plexus block. This is, again, you know, some, um, patients will present with pain in the pelvic area from uh, prostatic problems, testicular problems, ovarian problems, uterine problems, and, and, or cancer in those areas, frankly. And then this block can be performed to relieve pain in that area. The hypogastric plexus is here, L5S1. This is an anterior view, and the needle is, in, is placed posteriorly or through the disc at L5S1, and then 18 or so, 20 cc's of local anesthetic and or alcohol is then injected to help reduce pain. This is helpful, the celiac plexus block is helpful for usually pancreatic cancer or cancers that exist from the esophagus to the transverse colon. And it's performed at L1, around L1. The injection is performed and it's again local anesthetic and some neurolytic along the celiac plexus which lies here and here. These are the celiac vessels. Let me now talk about neuromodulation because I think this is again, an ever-expanding therapeutic modality, and I'd like you to understand a little bit more about it so you can identify proper patients. Again, I don't feel like everyone is a candidate for this procedure, but certain patients are, and it can make a difference in their life in a positive way. This relates to the delivery of small doses of current, if you will, to the epidural space or to various different peripheral nerves. The devices look like this. This is just an example of one. There are six now on the market now. They're similar. I mean, they would argue that they're not, but they, they are similar, actually, in terms of how they look. You have a patient programmer. A patient uses this. This is like a remote control device, like this, to turn the stimulator on, turn it off, for example, and you can, you can uh, change the parameters of stimulation, too. There's a generator, battery. Think of this as, I, I describe this, you know, as, um, similar to a pacemaker for the heart. This is a pacemaker for the spinal cord. You need a battery and you have a lead or a wire. In this case, the lead is placed in the epidural space. Well, what are the indications for this procedure? That is versus the application. So the indications would be related to what's FDA approved. Fail back surgery syndrome is a big one, right? Radicular pain, again, neuropathic pain. Think neuropathic pain, shooting pain down the legs, down the arms, shooting pain across the ribs along uh, intercostal neuralgia, for example. Uh, even for visceral pain syndromes, it's been used, I've used it, not with the same degree of frequency. Degenerative disc disease, complex regional pain syndrome, it's indicated for as well. Interest, we had a discussion on interstitial cystitis, I think that was yesterday. There, um, there is an FDA-approved stimulator device for IC, 
and it's called the interstim, and it's, the wires are placed along the nerve roots in the sacrum, actually, not along the epidural space. Now, this is used, actually, in other countries, not much our country, but other countries for inoperable ischemic leg pain and for refractory angina. A trial is performed first. The lead is placed under x-ray guidance, and uh, it's taped in place. That's what you can sort of see here. The lead is taped in place. There's an external connector that powers the lead or leads that are placed in the epidural space. The trial lasts for about six days or so. Patients go home. They can't, they can't bathe, unfortunately, but they can go home. They use it. And the idea is this. How much are they getting any relief? Is it, what we're looking for is usually 50% or more. Is their quality of life better? Can they sleep better? Are they using fewer short-acting opioids? Those are the, what we're trying to assess here. The batteries are fairly small, and they're getting a little smaller. This is a bat, what the batteries look like uh, compared to a quarter. And the batteries are typically implanted subcutaneously in the upper uh, buttock area. Well, I, these are the candidates, again, usually we're using this. I'll show you some data in a minute, but usually this is something that's used after other therapies have been exhausted. There's some evidence, though, that really we should be offering this a bit earlier, not waiting 10 years later. Interestingly, what, what happens is that when you place the device, patients feel a paresthesia, like a tingling sensation in the area of pain. There's a new device in the market, manufactured by Nevro, that uses high frequency such that patients feel no paresthesias at all, which is pretty intriguing. They would just feel pain relief if it's a successful trial. We're looking for, as I mentioned, sleep, mood activity improvement, and psychosocial comorbidities need to be addressed. If patients are excessively depressed, anxious, for example, well, those, those psychiatric illnesses need to be addressed before the simulator device is implanted because the evidence suggests that they don't do as well. They'll do better. That is, it's more successful if the underlying psychopathology is addressed. And in fact, a lot of insurers require pain psychological exams before we even perform these procedures. Animal studies, now this is really intriguing, I think. I mean, how does this device work? Well, animal studies show a couple of things. One is that the stimulator, that is the current, can activate the A-alpha and beta afferent fibers, trigger inhibition by influencing the interneurons of the spinal cord, and may, and may interrupt pain signals in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. It also may release norepinephrine and serotonin, right? I mean, that's what the tricyclic antidepressants do, for example, to decrease pain transmission. Really intriguing to me is that based on animal studies now, not human studies, but animal studies, that stimulation may be able to reverse central sensitization. Central sensitization is that, that pain amplification that occurs following injury or chronic pain conditions. And this is why maybe early intervention in select patients with spinal cord stimulation can be critical. Also, there's some evidence that spinal cord stimulation can suppress pain in the brain, not just the spinal cord. When we perform the implantation, it's done in the operating room. This is just an example of it. You know, this is the trial lead. There, this is a four contact lead. I mean, today there are eight contacts or 16 contacts, there are more. By the way, the electricity flows through these metallic um, structures called contacts. So the current is discharged through these things. And here's an example, an AP view of the spine. You can see the placement of the wire. This is what we see under x-ray guidance. And you place it in certain elements, certain areas of the spine, the thoracic spine, for example, or the cervical spine. And there are certain areas where you target it based on where the patient's pain is. I want to mention the high-frequency spinal cord stimulator device. You know, there are six different manufacturers. Uh, they all have certain interesting innovations that range from total body MRI capability, meaning if you have this implanted, you can get an MRI anywhere in your body. That's Medtronic, for example, Boston Scientific. Uh, and, and they range from those innovations to programming innovations to, gosh, we have, now we have a stimulator that doesn't require a battery. You just place the lead and you wear a belt that, that um, contains a transmitter that transmits signals to the spine, to that particular lead. Well, this one doesn't produce paresthesias. It doesn't produce anything other than pain relief if that were the result. It uses 10,000 hertz, so that's the high-frequency element, compared to 1,200 hertz, which would be the usual low-frequency stimulation. There were several studies on this device before it was approved 
It was used in Europe before it was used here, but there was a comparative study, RCT done, using this device versus conventional, that is low frequency stimulation, in patients who had typically lumbosacral radicular pain. And it was found that this particular device was superior to traditional stimulation for back and leg pain. And the effect persisted for about a year. So the value in this device could be twofold. One, patients don't feel anything, right, other than pain relief. And two, it may better treat low back pain. That traditionally has been tough to treat with stimulation. It can be treated even with low frequency stimulation. This device might offer something a bit more than that, meaning maybe a bit better relief of low back pain. I've used this uh, myself in patients who have low back pain, and again, low back or shooting leg pain or just low back pain with pretty good results so far. It's not for everybody, it doesn't always help, but it's something different. And for patients who don't want to feel the tingling sensation, I have to say that most patients, in my experience, don't complain that that's a problem, but some do. They don't want to feel anything, you know, it's not, or, or the tingling sensation, sometimes the wire when it's placed or implanted can still move. It's sort of mobile, even though fibrosis develops around it. You know, when they move, when patients move, they sit, they stand, they run. Well, sometimes the wire can move, and when it moves, then the tingling sensation moves. Well, that doesn't occur with this, interestingly, because there is no tingling sensation. I wanted to show you this wireless miniaturized system as well. This is new, manufactured by Stimwave. I showed you the battery before. The battery is implanted in the operating room, and that wire then is connected to the battery all subcutaneously when we do the implantation. This does not use a battery at all. Now, what it does use, though, is that so you place the wire in the epidural space, or wires, and then you patients wear a belt that contains a transmitter. The transmitter wirelessly transmits signals to the wire or wires that are placed in the epidural space obviating the need for the battery. Now, there are positives and negatives to that. Um, you know, there are some patients who are more, con you know, who, I mean, aesthetically, it's not as desirable, right? I mean, you know, because you're gonna have to wear a belt. Um, but some patients who maybe are, have a lot of comorbidities, not particularly good candidates for the operating room, uh, in terms of the implantation, may opt for this. Maybe older patients as well, or some who just don't want a battery. Uh, so this is something new, something that um, certain patients may like versus others. Uh, not as much information, we don't have as much data on this system, to be honest yet, as we do other systems, but it was approved because we have quite a bit of data on the effectiveness of spinal cord stimulation in general. This, what's the success rate, right? I mean, the success rate of spinal cord stimulation. Well, what we've learned from the data is that it's more effective if we apply it earlier during the course of pain. For example, there's about an 85% success rate in patients who have less than two years of pain versus just a 5% success rate in patients who've had more than 15 years of pain. Hence, the interest in thinking about this a bit earlier on. You know, I just trialed a patient last week who had liposuction done to her thighs. And this is, gosh, I think it was maybe 15 years ago or so, maybe longer than that. She developed intractable neuropathic pain of the thigh, mainly laterally and posteriorly. Multiple procedures performed, multiple medications, acupuncture, nothing helpful. So I trialed her. And I f actually felt like she was a good candidate. Unfortunately, it didn't help her. You know, she just did not, she felt the paresthesias, it was in the correct location, but it didn't really reduce the pain, her pain at all. And I think it's because she's had chronic pain for too long, and that would be supported by this data. Is stimulation cost effective? Yes, according to the data. You can see here, this was a study that was done on comparing stimulation to alternative therapies, things like physical therapy, chiropractic, massage therapy, doctor visits, MRIs, hospital admissions. And what they discovered was that the break-even point was at about two and a half years. Beyond that, the cost of conventional medical therapy exceeded that of spinal cord stimulation. There's no question, the upfront costs of stimulation are higher than conventional pain therapies. But over time, stimulation is more cost effective than alternative pain therapies. And I'm gonna end on peripheral nerve stimulation. This is a huge topic, frankly, too. But I wanted to mention a new device 
that was approved just this last year. Imagine that wire that I showed, that I showed you before, the spinal cord stimulator lead is what it's called. That's usually placed in the epidural space. It can be placed along the length of nerves as well. However, we have a new device that uses an even shorter wire than the spinal cord stimulator. The spinal cord stimulator wire is about you know, this long. The, this particular peripheral nerve stimulator wire is about this long. It's very thin, and the contacts are just four. So the electrical discharge occurs through just four contacts. And this has been shown to be helpful for patients who have focal mononeuropathies. Um, I've used this now in patients who've had stroke and have, unfortunately, residual shoulder pain and shoulder subluxations. And I've been impressed with its effectiveness. The axillary nerve is targeted posteriorly. It's performed um, under fluoroscopy or ultrasound and you use a needle and you place the wire subcutaneously along, say for example, the axillary nerve, turn it on, and, uh, and then the tail end of it is, is placed subcutaneously as well. Once you do that, this there's like a external pulse transmitter that's applied to the skin over the end of the tail of the particular lead. This represents the lead. The contacts are down here near the peripheral nerve, stimulating the peripheral nerve. The other end of it is here, and you apply the uh, external pulse transmitter over the skin where this particular distal end of the lead is located. And patients similar to spinal cord stimulation have a programmer. So again, it's like a external device that they use to turn it off, turn it on, and alter the programs. And interestingly, this uh, in, in patients, so this can be used for, and I haven't applied it to all these different conditions, I've used it for, to target the axillary nerve in patients who've had stroke and stroke-related pain, but it can be used in other areas, uh, for example, inguinal, neuro, inguinal neuralgia, genitofemoral neuralgia. Uh, I haven't used it there yet, but I think that others have and have found that it can be useful. Again, minimally invasive, and for those interested, you know, who've had stroke and they have this subluxation, if you turn the stimulation up high enough, they've, you can actually see their shoulder, it's sort of remarkable, um, move back into place, if you will, into the joint. And that's been helpful too for them in terms of gaining a little bit more mobility. I mean, it, it, they're not going to be able to use the arm to the extent that they could before the stroke, but it feels more comfortable. Instead of drooping, you know, it's, it's back in place. So this is a... Um, a new device that you could think of uh, in patients who have these focal mononeuropathies and who are not benefiting otherwise. The take home points then are this, I think. One, that we may see a rise certainly in integrative therapies for pain control, for chronic pain control due to the CDC guideline and the downward pressure on opioids, perhaps downward pressure on NSAIDs too. We may see the rise of more procedural interventions. Again, I think that I'm not saying that procedures are helpful for everybody. I don't think everybody's a candidate for them, and I don't use them for everybody. But I think they do have a role, and a certain strong role, for certain select patients. There's good evidence for short and long-term benefit for epidural steroid injections in patients who have clear-cut radicular pain. Good evidence for short and long-term relief with the facet radiofrequency denervation procedure and for the cooled radiofrequency procedure for the sacroiliac joint. Consider spinal cord stimulation in certain patients who have neuropathic pain from spine surgery, complex regional pain syndrome, uh, maybe sometimes post-repetic neuralgia even, intercostal neuralgia, and sometimes for visceral pain. And finally, we have the emergence of less invasive peripheral nerve stimulation for certain select patients. Listen, thank you so much.